like he's not eating. What's wrong with you? You don't want to be a little fat anymore? No, I'm just... I'll eat later. Michael, Michael Politano, did you eat before you got here? No, I'm just not hungry. <gasps> there is no God. Oh, Lucifer, receive your servants. <laughs> This is just about food. You see what you're doing to your mother? I have half a mind to go mausoleum right now. Say, fill me with your, you in your dreams, my No, I'm just gay, OK? I'm gay. I'm nervous. Because I didn't know how to tell you guys. Titus isn't my fireman's doctor. That was a lie. He's my boyfriend. Humans are social creatures, and long ago our survival even depended on our ability to build relationships. Otherwise, you'd probably get eaten by a leopard or something. Today, strong, healthy relationships are still important because they offer us security and comfort, and they're especially important in childhood. A lot of the research about how babies form relationships revolves around an idea called attachment theory, which describes how infants relate to their parents or caregivers. Today, we know that your experiences during infancy might even shape how you form significant relationships for the rest of your life. But how that works, and whether or not you have any control over it, isn't always as straightforward. Shortly after birth, infants seem to start getting attached to their primary caregivers, usually their parents. Psychologists define attachment as the deep emotional bond that makes you want to be with another person. It's why you miss someone when they're gone. So under stable family conditions and without life-altering events, your attachment style as an infant will probably carry into your adult life. But it's not set in stone, and there are a lot of dimensions that can affect it. For example, some scientists believe that if your attachment is insecure, but you're in a relationship with a secure partner, it can improve your own security. And that makes a lot of sense. If you had a rough childhood, being with someone who is caring and attentive can change your outlook on relationships. And the reverse is also true. There's some speculation that certain relationship experiences like a nasty breakup, could have a negative impact on your attachment, because it can make you feel like you can't depend on your partner. One way or another, the research seems pretty clear that our relationships and the care we're given as newborns can have a lifelong impact on us. But it's not always black and white. Being treated a certain way by your parents won't automatically mean you grow up to have behavioral problems, or that you'll be guaranteed to have healthy romantic relationships. Everyone comes from a family, and every family's got stuff. And that means that we all have stuff in our personal history, which is what the counseling psychology world means when they use the term family of origin. Hi, I'm Matt Sanford. I'm a licensed mental health counselor with the LifeWorks Group. So first of all, are you aware that you have a foo? By that question, I mean, are you aware that your family history was not just what happened in your family, but it's how your family culture and norms and roles and experiences and messages all impacted you, informed your belief system and your worldview, and to varying degrees, prepared you for how you do life now. Many people rarely explore these concepts very deeply. But many I talk to will generally say that their childhood was great or good or fine or okay or terrible or some variation, but many have not explored it much more than that. And that seems to generally hold true whether the food was rather good or rather bad. I think that's because our food is so pervasive and ingrained in our everyday lives that we just don't think that it would even be something to examine. So when no one in that environment does any examining, well then we don't develop the idea that that would be something worth doing. Instead, many families model the conception that this is who we are, this is what we do, so just accept it. This is almost this, there's, there's almost this implied threat in examining it, isn't there? It's like if you want to examine it, then you're suggesting there's something wrong with it, and then the family will be offend, offended by that notion. But what if, rather than it being something that's wrong to examine, that it's something that's unhealthy not to examine. Now, I'm, I'm going to guess that a, one of the top objections to this is that I'm encouraging people to blame their parents for their issues. And I hear what you're saying, but that's just not what I'm advocating. See, I think it's possible that someone might identify some past wounds or mistreatment, um, but, but examining foo isn't for the purpose of placing blame. That won't get us to a healthy place just as much as not looking. So, if that's not what it's intended for, then what is the goal, you might be wondering? That's a great question. I just have one question for you. How dare you be so nice to Elliot? Where was that guy when I was growing up? I was probably... Oh, is that going? supposed to be your answer? <laughs> you are ten times the father with him than you ever were with me. No, I don't think... Don't you change the subject. I, I, for my twelfth birthday, I asked for a beautiful Chrissy doll with beautiful hair that grows. <laughs> and what did you get me? A dirt bike? What the hell is a 12-year-old boy supposed to do with a dirt bike? <laughs> you 
You don't know me at all. Hey, you don't know me either. It's not like you ever took any interest in me. I was a kid. I wasn't supposed to. Now you got me there. Yeah, I do, don't I? Well, you were a tough kid to figure out. It was like having a foreign exchange student in the house. <laughs> you spoke your own language and wore a beret. Today, we're talking about family patterns, right? And identifying ways in which family patterns from our past are impacting us in the present. Now, I want to be real clear here that when I talk about family, I'm mainly talking about who you grew up with, right? And if you're out there and you were not raised by mom and dad, but you were raised by grandpa or you were raised by aunt or you were raised by, you know, another individual, fine, like totally fine. I'm not necessarily talking about like biological parents here. Basically, I'm talking about the family structure in which you grew up, right? And one of the reasons why it's important for us to kind of tune into family patterns from our past that are impacting us in the present is because ways in which we were sort of informed about the world and informed about relationships, um, that's going to impact us in the present, right? I mean, the best example really that I can maybe think of is let's say you grew up in a family where negative emotions or emotions that are painful and difficult like anger or sadness or grief weren't discussed or weren't even expressed, right? And so maybe like the family pattern becomes we ignored difficult emotions. Well, as an adult and as an individual that has now sort of grown up into our current society, I'd be super curious about whether or not that pattern is showing up for you in the present, right? Whether or not maybe when you're feeling grief, for example, you become overproductive at work. Or if you're feeling anger at a partner, you start drinking. Or if you are feeling sadness because you lost your job, you're over-exercising and not eating enough food, right? So it's important for us to tune in and check in about our past and specifically about the family in which we were raised and ask ourselves the question, what are the patterns that I learned then and how are they showing up in the now? It would help if you all showed up looking like a loving, supportive family. For how long? 10 minutes tops. See if you can get it down to five. Well, what a party. Why well, you make it seem so effortless? What do you need money for? A divorce? No. You're the only child who chose a spouse I liked, and she's the one who had to die. I know, that's, that's rough for you. You and Dad are getting divorced? Now, don't worry, sweetie. No one is fighting over you. Tell me the truth, okay? Because there's been a lot of lying in this family. And a lot of love. You can leave tomorrow after my going away party for Buster. I still can't believe he's going into the army. You know, he's doing it just to spite me. Then why are you throwing him a party? Just to spite him. Well, now, who the hell is going to unload the car? It's not fair to Buster. He's a nervous wreck right now. He's going into the army, for God's sake. You volunteered him. I knew you were going to throw that in my face. Just haven't met anybody who's not completely self-absorbed and impossible to have a conversation with. If that's a veiled criticism about me, I won't hear it and I won't respond to it. Hmm. We can decide who we want to spend time with. We can decide who our friends are. But there are also those relationships where we don't have a lot of choice. I mean, you probably didn't pick your parents. You probably didn't decide who your aunt was going to be. And for some of you, it might mean that you are in a relationship right now by marriage that you feel as though you don't have much choice. But I just want you to know that you do have choice. So the very first thing you have to wrap your head around is whether we're talking about a family member or someone that you're married to, or, or maybe even a working relationship where you're like, there's nothing I can do. That might be true, but you still have choice. So I wanna start first with family members because in my 20 plus years of working with individuals to improve their confidence, to help them live a better and fuller life, without exception, when people talk to me about feeling um, less confident, it almost always stems back to something early in their childhood, whether we realize it or not. So many of our insecurities and our negative beliefs about ourselves stem from an early relationship with a family member. 
So for example, if, if your mother, and you talk to her twice a week, and, and if at a certain point in the conversation things turn to, let's say, your weight or your physical appearance, and when it turns to that, you just get this knot in your stomach like, here it comes, I'm gonna get this backhanded compliment, or maybe they're actually gonna put me down, and it starts to turn to that. And if, if you know it's right at that moment that it's coming, then you can establish a better boundary. And as soon as the conversation turns to that topic, you can have some alternatives to say. Like, you know, mom, I, I, I love you. It's been great chatting with you today, but um, you know, I, I'm not comfortable talking about this. So give me a call back when we can talk next week. Uh, but I really don't want to talk about that right now because you know, it just brings me down and I love you to death, but um, I'd rather not go to a negative place right now. I want to think happy. So uh, I'll talk to you next week, mom. You do that a couple of times and you've established new boundaries. Now you, have, you don't have to write this person off unless you need to. You know, I don't know your situation, but you have to understand there's choice to be made and you have to decide, is this person worth it? I mean, we all have those people in our lives that you just have to take the good with the bad, but you don't have to take as much bad as you're taking. And you can set up boundaries so that you can really enjoy the good. I Did just you know that your biological family is only one part of your family tree? That's because for every blood relative you have, you have as many chosen family members as you'd like. The idea of chosen family is a pillar of the LGBTQ community, and it's a concept that's become fundamental to how many LGBTQ folks gain support, love, and affirmation. The irony is that for many queer folks, chosen family doesn't start out as a choice. When many of us come out to our biological families, we face rejection, confusion, or at the very least, a period of potential awkwardness. As queer people, our gender and sexual identities can make things weird, uncomfortable, or even hostile with our biological family for a while. So where do you turn when your biological family isn't ready to love you fully as you are? You turn to your chosen family, of course. The great part of chosen family is that you get to decide who is part of it. You get to choose your siblings, your parents, and your children. And you can have as many family members as you'd like. I, for one, have seven sisters, three moms, two grandmothers, and counting. When your biological family no longer supports you, your chosen family can play a vital role in providing support, love, home-cooked meals, and a place to crash. But more than that, chosen families can help build connections and mentorship across generations. One of the hardest parts about being queer or trans is that most of us don't grow up with queer relatives in our biological families who can show us the ropes. That's where a chosen family can be a powerful source of community knowledge and history. Are you a trans girl who can't find shoes in her size? Your chosen family can help. Or are you a lesbian who wants to know what it was like to be a lesbian in the 1970s? Your chosen family can probably help there too. Chosen family means picking your team. You don't really have a choice into where you're born into or like what you're adopted into, but like you do have a choice in the people that you have around you. <laughs> We're just really good friends. This is just what intentional caring relationship looks like. Our sexualities are fluid and there are no standards to our queerness. We all come from very different backgrounds, different cultures, yet there's so many points of intersection. It's important to find your tribe. That, that is mo mo the most important thing you do. You find people who understand what you are saying, you know, um, like that Twilight Zone episode where the girl from another planet has the face that uh, is different from the people on her, and they do the switch, and, and when the girls are switching, they cross each other, and one is this beautiful, you know, Marilyn Monroe type face, and the other, I think she may have a pig snout, I think. You know, it's a Twilight Zone. And anyway, that you find your tribe, and uh, you know, God love my mother and my sisters and my family, God love them. And we laughed, we had a lot of great laughs together, but it wasn't until I moved to Atlanta and I found my tribe. By the way, the, a tribe of people that I still work with today. The kids I met when I found my tribe are the producers of uh, Drag Race. And I met them uh, 30, 32 years ago. 32, here in New York actually, 32 years ago. So you, that's the most important thing, find your tribe. And the people who will support you. Because you know, you've got a self-saboteur. We haven't gotten, in, gotten into that. 
the self-saboteur, the ego, is your biggest foe. And you need people who are going to lift you up and support you, especially when your saboteur, the calls are coming from inside the house. When that rears its ugly head, you need people to say, wake up, wake up, you're dreaming, you wake up, wake up. You know, that's why that totem is there. Those people, your tribe, become that totem, that reminder that you're in a dream and to not take it too seriously. And to really be comfortable with who you are, Absolutely. even if it's different. Yeah. We are a family, like a giant tree.